right, great. I think we're going to get started. Um, so good afternoon and good morning. Uh, thank you again for being here. My name is Caroline Ayoso. I am the Senior Policy Associate at Homes for the Homeless. And we are really excited to engage you all in conversation today about the ways that shelter providers can begin incorporating pets into their services for families experiencing homelessness. Urban Resource Institute's People and Animals Living Safely, or PALS program, has been a leader in demonstrating both how critical the healing from pets can be for families experiencing homelessness and how possible it can be to allow for that relationship to thrive while in shelter. So we are thrilled to bring you some of the experts from their teams, um, Danielle and Colleen, who will speak with you about the challenges, surprises, and lessons learned in implementing the PALS program. Today's discussion and Q&A build on URI's article for ICPH's Beyond Housing magazine, which is a collection of ideas and solutions around family homelessness. If you haven't already, I hope you will find some time to read the magazine. At HFH and ICPH, we are committed to finding new and long lasting solutions that address the needs of families experiencing homelessness, one of which is co-sheltering families with their pets. So I hope that today you learn new tools that you can bring back to your own community and organization. Um, a few housekeeping, I, I mentioned a couple of them earlier, um, but we do have a Q&A function. So please share your questions there. Um, and we encourage you to connect with us and with URI on Facebook, Twitter, by email during and after the event. Um, and there will also be a very, very short survey shared with you all uh, that would, it would be great if you could fill out. So thank you again for joining us. And I'm now pleased to welcome Danielle Emery, who is the director of the People and Animals Living Safely or PALS program at Urban Resource Institute, and Colleen Parker, who is the Technical Assistance and Training Coordinator for the PALS program. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, good afternoon from New York City. Uh, good morning to those joining us from across the country. Uh, so wonderful to be here with you. I'm so happy to see people from all different um, sectors and different capacities and roles and hopefully uh, this will be an informative uh, hour that we will spend together. Uh, just to give you a little bit lay of the land for how the session will go, um, I'm going to start, uh, give a description of the history of the PALS program, um, how we got started, the development, uh, some challenges, successes, uh, how we worked through challenges, um, and how we uh, approach the program today. Um, I'm going to then hand it over to Colleen, um, who's going to do more of the, the why um, for co-sheltering, um, connecting PALS and domestic violence shelter to, you know, the issues of, around homelessness um, to try, uh, you know, to really give us all um, some more uh, of that background knowledge about why this is so important and how we can bring this to our communities and to those that we work with um, to hopefully be able to serve uh, both survivors of domestic violence uh, and people experiencing homelessness um, with pets. So, with that said, we're going to share the screen. Yes. So again, I'm Danielle Emery. I am the director of the PALS program. Um, I've been with URI since 2018. Um, prior to that, I was I worked at the ASPCA, uh, and then before that, I was working um, in a domestic violence research institute. So these are both issues that are very near and dear to my heart, um, and I'm very excited to be sharing more about our program with you today. And Colleen will introduce herself um, when she takes over a little later. Next slide. So about Urban Resource Institute, um, so many of you, uh, especially based in New York City, uh, may have heard of us before. We're a very large social services provider here in the city. Uh, we serve survivors of domestic violence and homeless families in, in New York with a particular focus on communities of color and other vulnerable populations. Uh, so we have, uh, our PALS program is within our DV programs at the moment. Um, and within our DD programs, we have uh, wraparound services for unhoused domestic violence survivors, uh, including emergency shelter and tier two shelter locations, uh, where we have both families, um, so heads of households with children and also single individuals who have experienced 
domestic violence. Um, and then within those shelter programs, we're able to offer PALS, um, legal assistance and education program, uh, economic empowerment. Um, and then beyond that, we have very robust community programs, uh, such as our relationship abuse prevention programs, abusive partner intervention programs, and crime victim services. So I share this additional information about URI um, to give you a sense that we are not an animal welfare organization. Um, when we started the PALS program, we were, we were not an animal welfare organization, and we have not turned into one. But we do have a program um, that recognizes the importance of human-animal relationships and the importance of keeping people together with their pets during times of crisis. Um, go ahead, Chloe. <laughs> so to get into a little bit of that history, um, so, and I, I do, not to overstate the importance of this webinar, but I do, you know, we like to tell the story of uh, how our president and CEO, uh, Nathaniel Fields, you know, learned about the program um, at a conference and learned about the idea of co-sheltering and the need for co-sheltering for survivors with pets uh, in 2012. And it was not an issue that he had previously, you know, heard of or that had been um, a piece of what we were looking to do at URI. Um, and he came back and said, why is no one doing this in New York City? We need to do this. And so trying to, you know, hope that today or this, the article in the magazine or this sparks this conversation to say, how can I make this happen in my community? How can we work together um, to create this community of care uh, for those who are seeking shelter for a variety of reasons with pets um, in your local community. Uh, so it took some, some research, um, you know, trying to figure out how do we do this? Um, are there uh, like regulations? Are there, are there things that are preventing agencies from doing this? Um, and we're pretty you know, surprised to learn that there wasn't anything in the regulations that said, you know, you can't do this, not allowed to have pets. Um, so we were able to work uh, with our city partners, city and state partners um, to, to, you know, kind of propose like we want to start doing this in one of our shelter locations. Uh, and the PALS program was launched in 2013. Uh, and so, you know, hearing about the program and seeing us here today and as we detail about our work, um, you know, it does, it can seem intimidating or it's like, is this what it takes to, you know, do co-sheltering or to be able to help survivors or unhoused families with pets? Um, and so I just, we tell the story to also illustrate that where we started is very different from where we are now. Uh, so when we launched in 2013, uh, we were at one of URI shelter locations. Um, so we picked, you know, one location um, where we were going to work specifically with that team on site um, to address, you know, their questions, concerns, and try to work with them um, to be able to integrate animals into the environment. So when we started, we didn't have dedicated staff. So all of the PALS support um, was offered and provided um, through staff who were on site um, in other roles. So it was a little bit of, you know, additional work uh, for them. Um, and we decided, you know, at the very start, as we were not an animal welfare organization, there wasn't as much comfort um, with having different types of animals in the environment um, to start with only cats um, and in designated PALS units. So we had, you know, certain apartments that were in the building, which based on the building, were, you know, isolated from other apartments where we could kind of keep people um, separated, concerns for allergies and asthma. Um, and when the program launched, um, we started with 10 uh, pet-friendly units in that one building. Uh, and then through success, uh, after the first year, um, the program was a success. We realized that there was much more need, uh, that five, 10, 10 units in one shelter building was not meeting the need of TV survivors in New York City uh, that were seeking shelter with their pets. Um, so we were able to expand. Uh, and, and pretty much from 2014 um, through 20, 2019, when COVID threw a little wrench in everyone's plans, um, we had been able to expand um, to one additional, sometimes two additional URI shelter locations uh, through, throughout the course of each year. Uh, so in 2022, uh, we are now at nine of URI shelter locations. Uh, we have seven dedicated PALS team members. Um, pretty soon we opened up to, after that first year, we opened up to um, all pets that were legal to own uh, in New York City. Um, we also do not have breed restrictions. Um, and we've now moved into, uh, as URI has opened new shelter buildings, uh, starting with Powell's Place uh, in 2018, uh, we launched, we opened these buildings that are fully pet friendly. So we no longer have 
you know, 10 or 15 units where those are, um, where pets are allowed to only be in those units. Um, it's now whole buildings, which gives us much more flexibility for getting people into shelter. Um, and, you know, going from that one site where we had 10 units or the two sites where we had 25 units, um, you know, our numbers have grown consistently to where we're now at the point of serving uh, more than 55, close to 60 uh, families with pets in our shelter buildings uh, each night. So a uh, very large program, but I do like to share the history because it gives you a sense that you don't have to start at every shelter location if you have an agency that has multiple locations um, and that you can work to figure out what works within your space and within your organization's capacity um, to begin welcoming pets. Uh, and sort of on a similar line, um, as Colleen and I are speaking more about the services and the, um, you know, the, the whys for the why we're doing this work, why it's important to keep people together um, with their pets and the animal uh, members of their family. Um, I also just wanted to give a brief overview of the services that we provide, um, not to say this is, you know, this is the full comprehensive, like, uh, a uh, menu of services that you have to be able to offer to all um, members of your community, um, but to hopefully plant some seeds of the different ways that you can interact with folks that have pets, um, that your programs, that your communities, that your partners that you work with, um, that you could come together uh, to provide very crucial services for folks, um, even if you're not able to do the whole, um, the whole, the full menu. Um, so what the first thing on here is Christ, this is kind of goes, um, through the timeline of our interaction with folks, but, you know, crisis intervention. So this, you know, is really about uh, relationship with New York City Police Department, with different crisis um, organizations that may be getting people who are in the hospital um, or are interacting with police that um, have pets and don't know what to do with the pets and are concerned about options and having those relationships uh, so that people know that there are resources available in those moments. Um, providing pet specific safety planning. So, you know, DV advocates um, are very, <laughs> very trained, very versed um, in people safety planning. Um, and so really wanting to incorporate pets into that process. Uh, our intake or screening or hotlines, you know, asking about pets. Are we bringing pets into the conversation and giving people that opportunity um, to include them in their safety planning or their planning for the future? Uh, information and referrals. I'll talk more about community a little bit later, but this is such a such a huge part of this work. We don't do it alone. Um, and I want to dispel the idea for any of you that you would be doing this work alone um, because it's pretty, it's impossible. Um, and so really, you know, this idea of connections and passing information. And if we're not able to assist someone for whatever reason, um, being able to pass on uh, their information or pass them along to someone else. And then there's co-living, which is the thing that we're, you know, we're talking about here or that we think about with the PALS program, um, which is that, you know, that co-sheltering, having people in the building um, with their pets. Um, we call it co-living because where we have our program now um, at the sites, uh, every family that is with a pet is in their own individual unit. So they're living together with that animal. It's not, there's some different forms of co-sheltering um, and, you know, there's all different options and things work better or worse depending on, you know, the size or layout or all, all different factors for your building. Um, but co-living is what works well for us. Um, pet supplies. So this is something that's you know, insanely helpful um, to folks who are, you know, in precarious situations for any reason, um, having access to those supplies. Um, so even if you weren't able to provide co-sheltering, um, if someone's dog was able to stay with a friend or family member, um, being able to get them supplies uh, while they are in, you know, in the shelter location or somewhere else is a huge support. Um, veterinary care, uh, same. Um, I'm assuming that probably some people on this call have pets because that often draws, draws folks to the topic. Um, we all know that veterinary care is insanely expens expensive. So especially for, you know, families that are unhoused or looking towards permanent housing, you know, having partnerships with vets um, or, you know, receiving funding to be able to support veterinary care is a huge benefit um, to, for folks to not have that financial burden. Um, something that I, I think is, you know, is a fun part of our program um, and is something that could be incorporated in many different ways is just the idea of humane education. So not only for folks that have pets, um, but, you know, bringing the 
the relationships with animals um, that children especially naturally have, um, or bringing some, you know, therapy animals or other animals into the environment that are sort of increasing the awareness um, around this, this issue and the importance of human animal relationship. Um, I'll speak to this a little bit later too, but discharge planning is a huge part of what we do. And so even if, you know, think about this, even if you don't have um, pets, um, if someone doesn't have a pet with them, like looking towards the future of thinking about what, how to be reunited with that pet or having pet friendly housing. Um, and then, you know, programs that just keep people in touch, you know, services that keep people in touch um, for ongoing assistance. Um, and then obviously we provide technical assistance and training. Um, and I also like, you know, anything that you're doing to kind of spread awareness, spread knowledge about the issue, um, the need uh, for these services, the needs uh, like in your community is such a, a benefit to uh, the survivors and families experiencing homelessness in your community. Next. So we've been doing this um, for almost 10 years. 2023 will be our 10 year uh, anniversary. So very exciting. Um, and throughout those 10 years and the year of, of prep before, um, we definitely get a lot of the same concerns. Um, and it is, and I don't want to say it's predictable, but it's a bit predictable. Um, and, and I think that's because they are very valid, very real, um, you know, very understandable concerns that people have when they're thinking uh, about uh, co-sheltering and having animals in spaces that have been primarily thought of as people spaces. Um, and so I know that some people submitted questions before this webinar and are submitting questions now. Um, so I want to just kind of like go through uh, some of the common concerns that we hear um, and then talk through ways that we have worked through them um, within our program. And hopefully that provides a little insight of uh, just, you know, how these things can be considered and what you could do um, in your environment. So first uh, is allergies. <laughs> Obviously, um, you know, pet allergies are a real thing. Um, there's a lot of people who are very allergic to cats. Um, cats more often, you know, you hear. Um, and so when you're in a communal, communal building, obviously that's going to be a concern. Um, that was a big concern for us when our program first got started. We were very much, um, you know, didn't want uh, to put anyone who may have severe allergies in danger. Um, excuse me. So something that uh, we instituted as part of the program uh, is asking everyone that comes into our shelter building um, if they have any allergies or animal allergy induced or allergy induced asthma. Um, and, you know, that is just helpful information to be able to have about everyone who's coming in. Um, something that people who aren't maybe constantly around animals or work at animal welfare um, don't know uh, is that if you don't have carpets or, or furniture um, that is fabric, uh, places for the, the dander and the fomites and things to collect, um, allergies and pet dander is actually like much less of an issue. Uh, so that is a huge thing of if you can think about spaces or if you have spaces that can be adapted um, to, you know, have like vinyl furniture or definitely not have carpets um that 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 limits um the the spread or uh effects on other residents in the building uh and i think just to share our experience we've actually had quite little <laughs> um serious concerns around allergies i think we also have the benefit of being a New York City based program, people are used to living in apartment buildings, um, have maybe lived or probably lived in apartment buildings where there have been pets around. Um, and so allergies is always one of the first, first questions that people have. And one of the first things that I say, we don't, we think about it, we thought about it, but, but fortunately, um, it's not something that comes up for us a lot. Um, and then the next very common concern that we hear about, um, you know, concerns around aggression um, and behavior, particularly for dogs, but obviously we know that all animals, this could be um, a challenge or a concern with. Um, and so what, how we do with this um, basically is we start through our screening process. Um, and through the screening process, uh, we're collecting information from clients. We're learning about their dogs. We're learning about their relationships. Um, with their dogs. We're learning about how they interact with children, with strangers, 
um, with other animals. Um, and we're starting to do have that conversation with them about how they, where they, <laughs> where they might have areas for improvement or where owners may have struggled. Um, because it's really important to us, especially for domestic violence, um, that there aren't, we're not screening people out of the program. We really wanna screen people in. So for us, we wanna know about what an owner's previous challenges or concerns um, may have been with their pets. Uh, and I'm also very, very happy to report um, that aggression from dogs is not something that we encounter um, frequently. Of course, it's, it's happened like very infrequently, um, but this is something that, you know, genuinely these are family pets that are used to living with their families um, and being able to stay with their family and to be handled by their owner and staying in a place that is feels safe and comfortable um, is really, really important for these animals. Um, and at the times, you know, when we when there may be behavior that is like slightly more concerning. Um, we work with that family. We have internal animal welfare expertise. Uh, we also have partners, um, uh, you know, certified behavior trainers. Um, we worked with vets, we've worked with ASPCA um, to try to get that additional support um, so that our clients are not, you know, it's, uh, it's never, they're not sort of left on their own to try to navigate that um, because obviously like safety in the shelter building is a priority for all of us. Um, I realize now, Colleen, I wasn't moving ahead. <laughs> Um, but as I was talking about these issues, the three things that we really wanted to, um, you know, uh, assert or really reinforce um, are just the ideas of how we've worked through a lot of these issues, um, which are communication. Um, I think it's creativity and community. Um, and that these, that really um, communication and so, you know, on the things that we've talked about, like knowing if someone has allergies, knowing we're in the building, there was a concern, hearing that, you know, someone's like, oh, that dog seems a little nervous when they're um, around other people. Um, hearing about these things is key uh, to us being able to problem solve, uh, to offer um, solutions and to work with that client. Um, creativity, I think about this a lot in getting people into shelter and in the creation of our program. Creativity and flexibility around, you know, we have policies, we have procedures that are in place um, for the safety and sake of the program, um, but sometimes we have to be flexible. Sometimes we have to work with a family to figure out a solution that may not be typically what we do in our program, um, but may enable them to get to safety. Um, and then community is, you know, huge, huge part of what we do. Um, you know, we're we're not, we do have animal welfare expertise on our team now, but we're not veterinarians. We can't, you know, provide vaccines, do medical care. Um, so we have those partnerships, um, you know, across the city. Uh, we do have other animal welfare partners, you know, who, if we're not able to take someone in, we may be able to arrange temporary boarding, or they may be able, may be able to assist with short-term foster um, or something to help. So really relying on our community um, to be able to uh, address uh, some of these common concerns, you know, such as pet care responsibilities um, or financial needs, you know, having those partnerships across the city um, really eliminates a lot of the financial burden that uh, our clients and uh, the program um, face. So I think I have gone over my time also. Um, it's not enough time. So this, this webinar was really, really intended to just, you know, give you a taste of the issues that we've thought about, that we've worked on, um, that we've faced as challenges and successes, and to say, if you want to learn more, we, we are here, <laughs> we want to offer our experience um, and you know try to help you think through how, how this could work in your community. So definitely an intro, um, but there's, there's more. And if you have questions, um, definitely ask them towards the end. Thanks, Colleen. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I think that this, uh, yeah, the, the community and the communication and the creativity are, are three huge Pieces that have really helped us in our in our program development. Um, Dale, I don't know if you wanted to say a, a piece about our our relationships that we formed with the community. Um, yeah, I'll just. Say, we things. would be, <laughs> our program wouldn't exist without our partnership with our our communities. Um, we're very fortunate that we live in New York City that we have these. Um, you know, opportunities for partnership, but these opportunities, you know, I, I think they exist in every community. Um, definitely, you know, Colleen and I, especially, and others, members of our team are very kind of tuned into the animal welfare world. Um, and there's, there's definitely interest, there's definitely engagement. And so, you know, we have these partners from, you know, private 
the ASPCA uh, is a private local animal welfare organization to the care centers, uh, which are, that is, you know, the public shelter, the open intake, um, and then Red Rover, which is an example of a national program um, that is very uh, useful and has funds available uh, for people who are looking to get into this work. Um, yeah, I, I think this is a really useful visual of just all of the different kinds of um, groups that we can be thinking of to help cover our, our client spaces and, and try and create that community web, because uh, no one of these organizations could provide any of those needs. Um, so as I, as I go ahead and take it away, thank you so much, Danielle, for setting me up with the, all of that. Um, it's, it's crazy to look back on PALS and, and, and think about how far we've come uh, from really just, a, you know, like you said, a conversation about a need that exists. Um, and I, I, I see this quote from uh, the original article that you wrote, Danielle, uh, for um, the magazine uh, to be, hit this uh, idea really poignantly, um, which is that uh, the fields of animal welfare and human uh, or people-centered uh, fields are moving together um, because the fields are recognizing that caring for animals and caring for people, it's the same thing. Uh, you know, we live in the same community. So with that in mind, like uh, Danielle said, I'm gonna rewind a little bit and talk about the why behind the program. Why is it relevant for uh, folks who work in homeless, uh, homeless services to be thinking about pets uh, or you know, domestic violence? How, how do these come together? Why do we need to be worrying about this? And um, as I'm sure a lot of folks who have spent time working in the fields of homelessness uh, or have experienced it are aware, Homelessness is traumatic. It is uh, a period of long-term stress and instability. Um, it involves an incredible amount of loss of a home, of dignity, of employment, all kinds of things. Um, it, it, it is uh, a painful and um, fraught experience in a lot of the ways that uh, domestic violence can be. Of course, they're not the same, but domestic violence also has those features of long-term stress and instability. Um, and in fact, in New York City, uh, domestic violence is the number one cause of homelessness. Folks list relationship violence as the reason that they lost their home in the first place. Um, in fact, um, more than 90% of women who are experiencing homelessness have experienced severe abuse at one point in their lives. Um, and of course, that's not to say that only women experience severe abuse, experience homelessness, um, and have pets. Uh, in fact, the uh, more our more frequent uh, clients of homelessness services and DV services are children. Uh, so, um, and additionally, uh, folks in the LGBTQ community are uh, you know very at risk for DV and homelessness. Um, and cisgender men, uh, men who are assigned uh, male at birth, are also uh, very capable of experiencing violence as well. I wanted to be clear about that. Um, and trauma can have all kinds of effects on your body and your mind, whether you receive the trauma from domestic violence, uh, from specifically street homelessness, or any other number of instances. Um, it can affect your body uh, by uh, causing fatigue and changes in appetite. Um, you can have a lower immune system, so you might get sick more often. Um, and you might have a lot of trouble sleeping, which can also compound those physical effects. Um, trauma can cause emotional uh, disturbances, including uh, shock and maybe denial in the period afterwards. Um, it can cause grief, uh, like I mentioned, um, depression. Uh, folks can go numb to protect themselves. Uh, folks can also experience hopelessness and despondency. Uh, there could be emotional outbursts, feelings of overwhelm, and also irritability and anger over things that maybe somebody that's not familiar with their situation uh, might not fully understand, um, but um, that person might be extreme uh, a greater amount of pain in relation to those triggers. Um, as well as emotions, uh, your uh, cognitive ab abilities uh, might be affected by trauma. Um, it can cause brain fog, uh, which is, uh, I think, a term we've been hearing more often uh, post-COVID, um, which includes difficulty concentrating, memory problems, um, mental rigidity is a big one. Um, when your brain has experienced a period of 
increased stress and unreliability. It is going to be a sort of survival tactic to want things to be predictable and want to be in control of things. Um, so that can be really tough when you're navigating public services that have a lot of rules and uh, that uh, you know you might not have a lot of choices. Um, there can also be a lot of self-blame and shame um, and uh, memory difficulties. Um, and this is all very relevant, not only because of the way it affects the individual in their body, but it can also affect the way that folks interact with their environment moving forward and interact with support services. Um, as much as uh, you know, we who work in uh, domestic violence resources, homeless uh, service provision or animal welfare want to help, the fact is that systems are large and complicated and they can be very re-traumatizing for folks. So, you know, when we are keeping in mind this rigidity, this, um, this possible numbing, grief, everything, uh, recentering it in, in the trauma and what we can do to minimize that trauma is very helpful. And that is why, uh, you know, after the conversation uh, that our CEO had, um, you know, in all of our conversations with our community partners, uh, we're realizing that uh, our, our, our pets, our relationships, our homes, our communities, all of these things need to come together in order to support our survivors of, of trauma, of homelessness, et cetera. Um, we know that relationships are protective factors for folks who have survived trauma. Um, domestic violence isolates you. Um, abusers can try to isolate you from the people in your life that you care about. Uh, when you're seeking safety, you have to leave the community you lived in to find a confidential location. And if you've lost your home and you're also experiencing homelessness, of course, that's another thing you're losing. So if you have a relationship, that is something that reminds you who you are. It can keep you centered in, in your, your place and time. Um, and um, it, can, it can remind you that there's more in the world. Um, and with our pets specifically, we know, we have learned uh, thanks to um, neuroscientists that chemically our relationships with pets look just the same as they do uh, in most ways uh, as they do with our relationships with people. Uh, there is a uh, neurochemical called oxytocin uh, that lots of people think of as the love hormone. Um, it is, uh, plays a huge role in mother-baby bonding. Um, and studies show that our brains produce more oxytocin, not only when we're interacting with, uh, you know, our own children, but with our own pets. Um, pets also raise our dopamine and our endorphin levels, which are uh, very good chemicals, they're happy chemicals, um, and it lowers cortisol, which is the uh, chemical that's associated with stress. So not only is that our pets the thing that folks love and provide just you know subjective comfort, but scientifically it is good for our brains and it is protective to have those relationships. Um, and these the animal relationships are not only again not only important for the individual, but they can be really helpful interpersonally. Uh, folks who have experienced homelessness and have pets have reported that having a pet with them with it, during their experience of homelessness helped folks see them as a person more than if they didn't have their pet. Uh, people with pets uh, that are experiencing street homelessness report that they receive more eye contact in a day when their pet is with them. Uh, people are more likely to extend assistance if they have a pet with them. So there is just, a, a, again, a dignity that comes along with it. And this can also be very helpful as a provider to build rapport. If you are acknowledging this important relationship to a client, if you are uh, helping them trust that their important relationship is also being cared for, um, as well as just them as an individual, that is going to build rapport and trust. And uh, they are going to sometimes be more likely to talk to you and, and ask for help, let you know what's really going on with them. And this can also be really helpful in provider relationships too. Again, folks like pets very often, and um, it can be a really good point to build, again, build relationships and rapport around and um, uh, increase our community web to um, support our folks with pets. Um, pets have played a really uh, strong role in trauma recovery for all kinds of events that folks have survived. 
um, when it comes to homelessness as a traumatic event. Um, pets, again, have a high, high rate of frequency to be experiencing this with their people. Um, in a 2019 study, um, about a quarter of uh, unhoused individuals uh, studied had a dog or a cat with them. So it's a very significant number of the population that's experiencing homelessness um, that need pet inclusive services uh, because they're out there with their pets. And I, I believe these are, these are only unhoused as well as opposed to folks staying uh, on couches and things like that. Um, and along with this high rate, we know that pet ownership has uh, measurable psychological benefits that do combat those uh, negative consequences of homelessness, uh, like I uh, explained in the previous slides, such as just the dignity, uh, likelihood of receiving help, eye contact. Um, I, the eye contact really hit me in the heart when I heard it, um, because I just think that Maybe now after the pandemic, maybe we do realize uh, more universally how important that kind of thing is uh, to go over a long time without really talking to a person. Um, even just a pet sometimes will help with that. Um, and um, I not, I'm, I'm sorry, I just lost my train of thought. Um, so um, the companionship and constancy that a pet provides um, is really protective, not only for uh, when you are navigating your housing, but also when you are moving forward in your recovery. Um, this photo on this slide is not actually from a domestic violence or a homelessness situation, but I really like it because it demonstrates the ability of pets to um, sort of take you out of the stressful situation that you are in and allow you to focus on your healing task. This is a photo of a little girl who has a learning uh, disability and instead of maybe feeling anxiety and shame by trying to read for a teacher, she's reading to this dog uh, because the dog doesn't care who she is or what her diagnosis is. Um, and it is making it easier for her to learn and move forward. And uh, so pets provide a very strong therapeutic role for a lot of folks in very similar ways. Um, a pet is never gonna ask you uh, why you didn't leave sooner. A pet is never going to ask you um, you know, why you would rather not enter a homeless shelter uh, because they wouldn't let you take your pet with them. They just want to love you. Um, and for a lot of folks, it's also an identity, um, a, a, um, a last uh, piece of your identity that you had before homelessness. Um, a lot of folks didn't acquire their pets after losing their homes. They are generally something that has stayed with them. Uh, throughout their journey there. So that is also something to keep in mind that it is just that reminder of who you are and what you care about. Um, and when it comes to uh, supporting folks uh, who have survived homelessness or DV with their pets, um, it's really, it's again, that uh, those three, uh, I think it was C words um, from earlier, it's the collaboration and communication, um, not just between uh, service providers and clients, but also between service providers and service providers. Uh, this is so essential. Um, it is going to build trust with our communities and it is also going to ensure that no uh, service provider feels like an island um, because no service provider can, can do everything. Um, so um, if a client can see, oh, well, this person I'm talking to can't help me with my cat, but they're, they're going to connect me with this other person that can, I still know that you care about my pet. That's a really big deal. Um, what that does is it is, it is reminding that client, uh, that person that it is, that they're allowed to be cared about, that the things they care about are important. Um, and and that sort of, that's what dignity is to me. And that's why it, dignity is, is such an antidote to the shame and isolation of trauma and of um, DV and homelessness. Um, if we, if, if I as a person don't like, Oh, I don't even want to say it. If I, as a person, don't like cats, it's not true. It doesn't matter. If my, as long as my client knows that I care, that they love their cat, that's all. That is truly what matters here. Um, and um, you know, that, or that I should say, that's the seed of what matters. Because if 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 I care about that client and that client's relationship, I can make calls, I can build relationships, and I can explore other ways to help them. Um, so now we were going to uh, invite a, um, one of our own survivors from the PALS program to share a little bit about 
with their relationship with their pet meant to them and uh, how um, it has been a stepping stone to also helping others. Uh, so I'm gonna stop sharing and then I'm gonna reshare. Um, so bear with me. I'll just say that the, the connection to dignity, I think is so important um, in what Deidre is going to share here, just this idea of you know understanding that pets are important to folks an important part of you know the help that they're seeking and the needs that they have and that that should be you know factored into if not uh, centered in responses that we are offering to folks um, so i'll let her talk <laughs> sorry guys Do you want me to try and call? Oh. Did it work? All right. There's no sound. There's no sound? I can do it too, for me. I don't know why it's not working. It just worked when we were practicing it. Um, I, I'm gonna, I'm sharing computer sound. All right. Let me try one time. We'll try one. I'll try it once and see. I don't know what's if, gone wrong since before. I it wouldn't be a a presentation I'm involved in. Yeah, if I didn't just have sound. Stop sound. sharing. my apartment i moved in my apartment i shortly um, started working for city council member steve levin at district 33 um and i was his director of constituent services um with that i dealt with homeless people our people our population right like i dealt with victims of domestic violence i dealt with advocating for um hra services to ensure that families and and residents of the city of new york had all their benefits that they were entitled to um you know again all the things that i saw inside there that people were fighting for and and just things that we needed just to survive where you know i put it in my head to ensure that i could give back right and and like you don't want to be a victim when we talk about that so much and not being victimized and the way i chose to not be victimized by our system anymore was to give back and help and uplift people so um i continued a partnership with you guys you are right and the PALS program. And um, I started to get a lot of calls about people and their pets and just like the situations. Like, I'm, I don't want, again, we hear this all the time, right? I don't want to go into shelter because of my pet. Well, you pick, you know, you call the right person because guess what? I was that person. I, you know, I, I know firsthand what that is like and, and what the struggle is, especially when you have small babies and children. So I started advocating and I'm like, well, how come? only in the dv spectrum people can come into shelter and only through uri specifically in the city of new york can people come into the shelter system with their pets and why is there such a a, a boundary put up to say who who gets housed and who doesn't and who's safe and who doesn't so i you know with my legislative director um and the council member you know this had been a conversation that they had been having but i kind of like okay let's push the envelope i'm, I'm all about pushing the envelope on things um and and we did it took a while we went through covid and we were like oh no this is not gonna happen oh my god and i was like no let's let's like once we got hearings back and i'm like okay but what about that bill 
Like I was destined to ensure that before the council member left office, that that bill would get passed and that at least I could be inspirational and bring some sort of victory and some sort of relief to, to families, right? I did the, um, So what Deidre's speaking about there uh, is a couple of bills that were passed in New York City Council uh, at the end, this was the end of, or very beginning of 2022 or end of 2021, um, you know, requiring um, DHS to, you know, collect data about how many people are seeking shelter with pets um, and then to eventually also develop a plan um, for being able to accommodate uh, pets and shelter. So, uh, Deidre really championed those bills. Um, so and she's an incredible, incredible advocate um, for not only survivors of domestic violence, but you know people with all different needs and seeking services in New York City. So we are so grateful to have had her, um, her voice in helping us advocate for those bills. I, I just wanna, um, before we move past the moment, uh, just reiterate uh, one of the lines she said that I think gets to the heart of why I'm so glad that we're, uh, you know, from a DV organization speaking with uh, folks uh, from homelessness provision about the human animal bond. Um, and she said, why is there such a boundary between who gets to be safe and who doesn't? Um, who, you know, why do some people get to be safe, have these services and who doesn't? And I just, you know, there's no good answer to that question. Um, you know, there, there isn't a, everybody should get it. And, and um, we all have pieces of that puzzle, so. Um, I'm going to share one last slide um, while we're doing Q&A, uh, just so that um, we have our email address, uh, a link to, uh, we uh, produced a PALS report uh, in 2021, so a link to download a free copy of the PALS report, um, speaking more about our program and some research that we did with the Na National Domestic Violence Hotline. Um, links to Red Rover, uh, links to grants.gov, um, which uh, the PAUSE Act was funding that was passed a couple of years ago, um, makes resources available to folks providing shelter um, for those who've experienced domestic violence. Uh, and then of course, our uh, team's email address, um, which is monitored uh, very <laughs> constantly. So if you ever have any questions or referrals or just you know want to chat through um, a client situation or learn more about training or technical assistance, um, you can reach out to us there. Uh, Q&A time. I don't know if Caroline, you're coming back. Hello. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much. That was so informative and engaging. And I um, especially enjoyed hearing from Deidre as well. Um, we have a lot of great questions, so we'll get to as many as we can. Um, and we also have some that were submitted when you all registered that we'll try to get to as well. Um, the first question that's come up in a couple different ways from people is about how this looks in um, in different types of shelter settings. So more congregate settings or um, roommate situations. Do you all have any experience? Um, do you know of other programs that have dealt with that? Um, yeah. Yeah, so um, as I mentioned, and as the, the question also asked, um, you know, we, we are fortunate enough to have, uh, you know, large capacity, and so we're able to limit uh, animals into people in their own apartments. Um, but Colleen and I, especially, and other members of our team have been very involved in a lot of different coalitions and task force and talking with organizations of all different types. Um, a great resource, if folks don't already know about it, um, is My Dog is My Home's um, co-sheltering collaborative. So they have quarterly meetings of all different types of shelter providers. Um, and I, I, do, I do know and have spoken with uh, some of those providers, especially in Los Angeles. I think they've had the most success doing this uh, in California um, that have had success with people having um, their support animals and pets in communal spaces. Um, you know, a lot of the kind of creativity and communication that we're talking about with our program, you know, a lot of that is still applicable when thinking about, um, you know, a communal space or a space that looks a little different. Um, are there ways that you could, you know, set aside certain spaces like in your environment that you would, you know, you may have to move people around or shuffle a little bit, but know that if you had a, a pet referral that this is an area that could 
allow for a crate um, that has enough space that is close to an exit that could be, you know, they don't have to walk by as many people maybe um, to be able to get outside with their dog. Um, you know, just different ways to explore that it could, you know, work in different environments. I know there's a lot of, um, I say a lot, there's a few organizations that, you know, make crates or want to donate crates to homeless shelters, um, want to donate, um, you know, supplies to folks that are trying uh, to help pets in those type of environments. Um, and, and definitely, you know, people have had success with it. And I think a lot of, you know, what, what Colleen was speaking to about, you know, that sense of um, dignity and that validation that really let people experience from being able to have their pets um, is, is so important to just, you know, try to consider um, ways that it could work even small scale. Great, thank you. Um, a couple questions have come in also about exits to permanent housing for um, families experiencing homelessness who have pets. Do you, how does that work? Are there any other challenges um, in, in finding permanent housing for your clients? Yeah, I think being a New York City based program, um, I think our challenge is more the availability of permanent and affordable housing for our clients um, and less that the, the, pet, the pets are uh, an impediment. So in some ways I feel like I can't, super fairly answer this question, um, except to say um, that it doesn't like for us and for our population that we're working with, um, if people are able to find housing, we're usually able to do advocacy. Um, if they have emotional support animal documentation, we can do advocacy on that. We can demonstrate that this person has lived with their pet in an apartment style building. Um, they mm. have been a, you know, we can write letters. They have been a successful participant in our program. This animal is up to date on vaccines. They're spay neutered, you know, this is their behavior. Um, so we are able to do that like individual advocacy, um, which, which does help. Um, and then also with the emotional support animal um, documentation, you know, kind of explaining that to landlords um, and explaining the process. Um, we've also had success that way. So I think, the bigger issue is the availability um, of affordable permanent housing for folks. And then the secondary issue is, you know, if someone is able to find that, how can we work individually um, to advocate for them? I think um, I think with a lot of things uh, in in the course of our program development, um, or I, mean, I should just speak with my for myself, but I think that one of the most surprising things that I, I've encountered is that in, in so many of these situations, the problem isn't the pet. Um, the, the it's it is really it's if if there if there was housing then you know there would be a problem and and so forth. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, sorry, Danielle. Did you want no, to say? No, I think that's so true. Not I mean, yeah, with housing, but it's just you know like uh, you know challenge like challenges that may occur among residents or roommates or, you know, it's like, those are challenges that we're already facing. Um, you know, pets can sometimes add to that, but it's, you know, it's not, the pets are usually not the, the source of the problem. Um, it's the realities and the full human beings that we all are um, living in these spaces, uh, you know, that, that leads more to those challenges than the pets. Got it. Um, there's also a, um, a question or two around partnerships with local vets. Um, mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about what those partnerships look like? Do you have an MOU with local vets um, and how, how do costs work? That sort yeah, of thing? so we're super fortunate to partner with the ASPCA, which has um, a big community-based program here in New York City. So our clients are able to take advantage of that. We do have an MOU with them. We started, um, from day one of our program, having an MOU with them. Um, we do also have smaller private uh, vet uh, emergency hospitals um, and individual vet practices that we work with, um, which we have either linkage agreements or MOUs with, or just, you know, set up payment or they provide, you know, not totally free care, but maybe a discount um, for nonprofit or, you know, they know the type of pr program that we are. So they're able to work with us. Um, on funding, like I said, vet care, as we all know, um, it's very expensive, particularly emergency vet care, um, but we do have, there are a number of, you know, foundations and sources for, for grants that are 
you know, interested in like funds that are supporting animal health and welfare for folks that are co-sheltering. So um, we've been lucky enough to, to get those foundation dollars um, and to be able to provide that medical care. Um, so again, that's that community, community, just doing that outreach, um, talking about the issue, talking about the services that you're looking to provide um, that the, the vets or the animal welfare partners in your community may be able to offer. Um, Animal shelters are a great place because a lot of animal shelters are going to have also relationships like with vet offices. So they may able, um, be able to uh, you know, offer discounted services or certain um, approaches that you may have not considered that don't require like 100% like you coming up with it on your own. Great. And I think perhaps our last question, we may be able to seek in another one, but um, is around insurance. Um, so have you experienced resistance from insurance carriers when setting up co-sheltering programs? Um, how did you overcome that? Yeah, so, and I, I definitely um, I can, pro can provide for folks if you reach out to us about the insurance questions. I know a couple organizations that are specifically like wanting to talk about the issues of like insurance in um, buildings with pets. Um, but for us, uh, our insurance, you know, we, we reached out to just to work with our insurance provider and it was really them wanting to see that we had policies um, that we had, um, you know, kind of done risk assessments that we were, you know, open to, like, if there were, there was a history of behavior history, you know, that we were going to be muzzling dogs or that we have behavior interventions or that, you know, we were limiting interaction between people and not their pets, um, that they just, I think what was most important was just this conversation and showing that we had developed policies and that we had responses in place um, to if issues did occur. Uh, and then just, you know, keeping that line of communication open um, as things grew. Uh, and I'm sorry to Victoria, I think that's your insurance carrier dropped you um, because staff and volunteers not allowed to handle animals. That's another part of our program. Um, the, the resident is fully responsible for the care of their animal, um, which is such an important part um, of just like animal comfort and safety too. I think, you know, obviously if you're not an owner, you can also handle, <laughs> it's, there's safe ways to handle animals, um, but it does mitigate a lot of those concerns because the, you know, they're being cared for by someone that they already know um, very well. But yes, not without its complications um, and definitely, you know, not to keep going back to the creativity, communication, um, and community, but, you know, getting those, showing that you have those resources to offer you support, you know, if you don't have that animal welfare expertise, um, and showing that you have policies or thought things through or have, have ways to respond, um, I think is, is a great place to start. Great. Well, thank you all so much. Um, thank you, Danielle and Colleen, and thank you to everyone who attended. Um, if you have further questions, you know how to reach PALS and Danielle and Colleen. Um, so thank you again, and I hope everyone has a, a wonderful rest of their day.